You are with the Church of Abundance. It's Sunday morning, 10 a.m., and we are listening to Wash Away. It's a Creative Commons license. Wash Away. You are with the Church of Abundance. It's Sunday morning, 10 a.m., and we've been listening to Wash Away, a Creative Commons license, Wash Away. Thank you for joining Pastor France and the Church of Abundance. Father God, may you guide us in our studies today on church history. Today we're looking at Protestantism to Protestant families. They are in the order of 1,200 Christian organizations, and that's just looking at North America. Worldwide, there are around 30,000 Christian organizations. There are an estimated 590 million Protestants worldwide. These include 170 million in North America, 160 million in Africa, 120 million in Europe, 70 million in Latin America, 60 million in Asia, and 10 million in Oceania. Nearly 27% of the 2.1 billion Christians in the world are Protestants. Now that comes from the New World Encyclopedia. 
Now, if you're looking at polling data from early 2001, and this is in the United States, but it gives us some sort of idea because the rest of the world is fairly similar. 76.5%, and that is 159 million Americans identify themselves as Christian. This is a major slide from 86.2% in 1990. Identification with Christianity has suffered a loss of 9.7 percentage points in 11 years. 52% of Americans identified themselves in 2001 as Protestant. 24.5% are Roman Catholic. 14.1% do not follow any organized relig religion. This is a rapid increase from only 8% in 1990. 1.3% 1 are Jewish, 0.5% were Muslim. An interesting point is the fastest growing religion in terms of percentage is Wicca or the Wiccan religion. It went from 8,000 followers in 1990 to 134,000 followers in 2001. Their numbers of adherents are doubling about every 30 months. Families, families of Protestants. One method of sorting Protestant faith groups is by family. Within each family, individual denominations share a common belief system and or a common heritage. The following is an example of one of many such models. It was largely patterned after J. Gordon Melton's The Encyclopedia of American Religions. So families, Adventists, Baptists, Christian Science, Communal, Eastern Orthodox, European Free Church, Holiness, Independent Fundamentalist, Latter-day Saints, Liberal, Lutheran, Messianic Judaism, Pentecostal, Pietism, Methodist, Reformed, Presbyterian, Spiritualist, Anglican Communion. Let's put that a little, little bit more detail into those families. If we look at the Adventist family, it's made out of Adventist groups, such as the Jehovah's Witnesses and the British Israelism. Is Israelism. The Baptist family, Southern Baptists, American Baptists, and many other types of Baptists. The Christian Science metaphysical family. Interesting that they take the Christian Science and combine that with the metaphysical family. And in there we get the Christian Science, we get New Thought, the communal family, the Jesus people, Twin Oaks, and etc. The Eastern Orthodox family, that's various Orthodox churches, such as the Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Serbian Orthodox, and so on. European Free Church family, the Amish, the Brethren, or the Plymouth Brethren, Mennonites, Quakers, Shakers, and etc. The Holiness Family, Christian and Missionary Alliance, Church of the Nazarene, and etc. Independent Fundamentalist Family, 
Plymouth Brethren, Fundamentalists, Bible Churches, Conservative Baptists, and etc. Latter-day Saints family, also known as the LDS, or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Community of Christ, and then we get the Lutheran family, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the Lutheran Church, the Missouri Synod, and there's many other members. If you look at the Messianic Judaism family, Assemblies of God, Church of God, the priest, the Pietist Methodist family, Scandinavian Pietism, United Methodist Church, and other Methodist churches. Reformed Presbyterian family, we have the Reformed Church, various Presbyterian churches, Congregational Churches, and United Church of Christ. Then we get the Western Liturgical Family, and that consists of the Anglican Communion, Roman Catholicism, including the Latin Church and the Eastern Rite Churches, Armenian Catholic Church, Chaldean Church of Christ, the Coptic Church, the Marianite Church, Melkite Syrian, Old Catholicism, and the Ukrainian Catholic Church. If you look at the liberal family, we get the Unitarian Universalists, Humanists, Progressive Christianity, Evolutionary Christianity, Ethical Culture, Free Thinkers, Secularists, and etc. If you look at the spiritual, Spiritualist, Psychic, and New Age family, we get Swedenborgianism, Spiritualism, New Age groups, and etc. The Liberal, Moderate, and Evangelical. The Time Almanac in 2002 quotes the Hartford Institute for Religious Research, who divide Protestant Christian denominations into three groups, the liberal, moderate, and evangelical, new age groups, and etc. So if you look at liberal, you can compare that to left wing, the moderate are in the middle, the neither liberal nor conservative, and the evangelicals tend to be the more conservative groups. Liberal Protestant, also known as the liberal wing. Episcopal Church, Presbyterian Church in the USA and in other countries as well, the Unitarian Universalist, and the United Church of Christ. Moderate Protestants, also known as the mainline wing, American Baptist, Disciples of Christ, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, Mennonite Reformed Church in America, and the United Methodist Church. Some individual congregations of these denominations range over the full range from liberal to evangelical. Individual members within congregations could be anywhere from liberal through to evangelical or conservative. And then we get the evangelical Protestant, also known as the conservative wing. Assemblies of God, Christian Reformed Church, Church of the Nazarene, Churches of Christ, Independent Christian Churches, Seventh-day Adventist, 
and the Southern Baptist Convention. Added to this group are many non-denominational conservative churches. The liberal wing, for example, Progressive Christianity, the Center for Progressive Christianity, TCPC, the Center for Progressive Christianity, is a network of affiliated congregations, informal groups, and individuals. They can be looked at as an unofficial spokesman for liberal Protestantism. Their mission is to reach out to those for whom organized religion has proved ineffectual, irrelevant, or repressive, as well as to those who have given up on or are unacquainted with it. To uphold evangelism as an agent of justice and peace. To give a strong voice both in the churches and the public arena to the advocates of progressive Christianity. To support those who embrace the search, not certainty. Most of these liberals see major parts of the Bible as reflecting God's will. However, they generally reject other portions of the Bible as being no longer valid. What do you think about that? The liberal moderates see such stories as the Genesis creation sequence, the virgin conception of Jesus, and worldwide Noachian flood, that is the flood, etc., as religious myths or folklore. Stories of immense spiritual power, but unrelated to actual historical events. They see that many Bible passages and themes must be interpreted as evil and contradicting the will of God. For example, passages which regulate slavery, advocate genocide, assign an inferior role to women, promote religious intolerance, condemn homosexuality, and etc. Now still going on with the liberal moderates and evangelicals, they regard hell in symbolic terms, not as a place of eternal torment. They regard the Bible as errant, having been written by individuals without the direct inspiration of God, whose motivation was to promote their own theological and spiritual beliefs. They generally believe in the theory of evolution, either theistic evolution or naturalistic evolution. They are keen to learn from theological studies into the historical Jesus in order to better understand what his precise teachings were. On social matters, the liberals rely heavily on the findings of social and natural sciences. Most of them are political li liberals, independents, or they could even be moderates. They give a high priority to combating racism, 
sexism, poverty, and homophobia. They are supportive of abortion access and educational programs to prevent unwanted pregnancies. The liberal moderates and evangelicals believe that a person's sexual orientation is largely genetically predetermined, is not chosen, is fixed, natural, normal for a minority of humans, and is morally neutral. Relationships should be evaluated by their quality, not by the genders of the couple. Many liberal denominations will conduct uni union services for gays and lesbians and will ordain homosexuals who are celibate or in committed relationships. Some support same-sex marriage for loving, committed same-sex couples. Let's listen to Jane Dibbins, what child is this? And then after this, we'll go on with the moderates. It's a Creative Commons license. What child is this?
Now we carry on with the mainline wing, which is the moderates. The mainline wing, for example, the United Methodist Church. These are the moderates. And as the name implies, these are faith groups whose beliefs, priorities, and policies lie between the conservatives and the liberals. Now, the mainline wing, they look upon the Bible as containing the word of God, but do not necessarily view all passages being the inerrant word of God, despite the postmodern disagreements as to the origins and exact meaning of the Bible, mainline traditions acknowledge truth emanating from the Bible, but do not, do not always agree as to the form that biblical truth must take. For example, the concept of hell as a place of eternal punishment and individual salvation are not stressed. So it's not denied, but it's not stressed. The mainline wing are divided about their belief in the origins of life and the universe. Only a few members or ministers in them would condemn the use of alcohol in moderation. Their theologies tend to be moderate and influenced, consciously or not, by the higher criticisms. Broadly speaking, the larger U.S. mainline churches are, and it's fairly similar in other places of the world, the United Methodist Church, the Episcopal Church. Now, the Episcopal Church is very similar to the Anglican Church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and the United Church of Christ. So these are the typical mainline churches. If you look at some more of the mainline churches, the Presbyterian Church, the Church of the Brethren, the Disciples of Christ, and of course, the American Baptist Churches. And then we have something called the International Council of Community Churches. We're looking at the mainline churches still, especially in the United States, black denominations are most likely to be identified as mainline churches, as are the larger Methodist churches. The African Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME Zion Church, and the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. The UMC, the Episcopal Church, UCC, PCUSA, Disciples, AME Church, and the AME Zion Church are all members of churches uniting in Christ, which is an effort to coordinate their works to prevent needless duplications of effort and to prevent animosity and to allow them to view each other as valid Christians participating in the Universal Church's mission of spreading the message of the hope of salvation. Many hope that this will serve as a prelude to a merged national 
super denomination, somewhat analogous to the United Church of Canada. Mainline denominations. Most mainline denominations have experienced long standing and serious internal conflicts because their membership is largely split into two wings, and that is the conservative and the liberal. The administrative le leadership of the denomination is typically liberal. However, renewal ministries within these denominations are pressing for a return towards more conservative beliefs. Mainline denominations have gradually over time become more inclusive. So in other words, the mainline denominations have over time shifted slowly towards the left. For example, decades ago, they fought over the issue of equality of women. This was settled by allowing women to be ordained and to hold positions of power in the denomination or in the church. Current conflicts deal mainly with human sexuality, particularly sexual orientation. Many mainline denominations may be faced with two future paths, going through a schism, in other words, breaking up, or developing some sort of local option to allow individual congregations or groups of congregations to decide independently whether to conduct union ceremonies and ordain homosexuals. The latter would preserve the universal denomination while transferring conflict to the local level church. Now, as you know, churches are supposed to be local churches in any case. And so that means the conflict is coming back to the local church. Carrying on with mainline denominations, those faith groups that are struggling with the issue of homosexuality a four obvious responses to the problem of equality for homosexuals and bisexuals. All the alternatives are painful. Each of the three main US denominations, which are actively debating the issue, have chosen, or to be more correct, have had the choice thrust upon them. And they have to choose one of these paths or are forced to choose one of these paths. Now, the liberal wing, so, so that is the liberal part of the main line or, or the moderate denominations, the liberal wing, what they do is they grant equality to all church members. Now, this will probably cause a mass exodus of conservative members to fundamentalist and other evangelical denominations, in other words, to the conservative side. So you see what's happening here as they embrace the liberal side, the conservatives are upset and they want to leave and go somewhere else where they can be more conservative. And then you get the United Methodist approach to this problem. So what the United Methodists do is they retain the inequality while continuing the debate. So the debate has been going on for decades and probably will for the next so many decades as well. And while this has been debated, they 
live with the resultant tension and division, but they haven't actually made a decision. The result of this ongoing debate is that the conservatives are actually winning because nothing changes while it's being debated. And so this approach will probably cause a, max, a mass exodus of liberal members who will either leave organized religion altogether or switch to a more liberal denomination. It will probably discourage significant numbers of youth from entering the church in the first place though the UMC, the United Methodist Church, seems to be leaning strongly towards accepting homosexuality as appropriate. So in other words, the issue of abortion and sexuality is tearing the churches apart. Because the Bible actually speaks against it. And so when it's forced upon the people, it tears the church apart. Now consider this. Open minds, open hearts, open doors. The people of the United Methodist Church. Now that is their church slogan featured in many United Methodist Church TV commercials and on their denominations website open minds, open hearts, open doors. And this is an attempt to get everybody in <clears throat> while they discuss this um, requirement over the next how many decades. And still looking at the mainline denominations, let's look at the Presbyterian approach to deal with this problem of sexuality and abortions. Now, what the Presbyterians do, they adopt a local option policy, thus thrusting the conflict from the denomination or the universal group of, of churches, the denominational level, to the regional or congregational level. So again, they're taking from the group side and they're putting the responsibility on the local church. Now, by doing this, liberals at the specific local churches will be unhappy because of the restrictions on homosexual and bisexual members that have been in, put in place by the local churches. And some conservatives will be unhappy because of the sexuality issues. So it's a lose-lose situation. Whichever way they go, the people are going to be unhappy. Maybe they should just go for the truth and let people be, they're going to be unhappy in any case. Now, in the Presbyterian approach, the homosexuals will be ordained or have the relationships formally recognized. The Presbyterian Church in the United States, for example, has yet to implement a local option for recon recognition of same-sex relationships. So in other words, they haven't even progressed to that point in time where the local churches they have that option to recognize or reject same-sex relationships. Now, still looking at the mainline denominations, let's look at the Episcopal Church approach, or that is really the Anglican Church in the United States. So the Episcopal Church approach. So what they allow to happen is a schism so the splitting of the denomination into two groups, one into a conservative group and the other into a liberal group. 
So by doing that, everyone loses. This has happened in the past during other conflicts. For example, human slavery, the conflicts about human slavery, the conflicts around interpretation of the Bible, the conflicts around female ordination, and etc. Every time they have a conflict, the church splits over the conflict. Now, sometimes the splitting or the schism is healed many decades later. Sometimes, or very often in actual fact, both groups continue on their beliefs that they split over. And as time goes by, they become more firm in their, that direction of thinking so that no reunion is possible. And now let's look at the conservative wing. We've gone all the way from the liberals to the moderates or those in the middle. And as we saw, the moderates were halfway to the liberals and halfway to the conservative, and they were being split because of that tension in, the, in themselves. Now, if you look at the conservative wing, and good examples are the Southern Baptists, the Assemblies of God, the Evangelical Churches. Now, the word evangelical was derived from the Greek word eongion, which means gospel or good news. Now, 11% of Americans describe themselves as evangelical. In the autumn of the year 2008, a public opinion poll by Ellison Research showed that 36% of American adults have no idea what the term evangelical means. Some subjects gave some really off-base definitions of evangelical, and these definitions given by people were given enough that they actually form statistics. And what a lot of people thought evangelical means is, to give some examples, one living as close to the Torah as the know-how. Evangelical, living as close to the Torah as the know-how. Other people believed that an evangelical was a Mormon. Some believed that an evangelical was a devoted Catholic. Some believed that evangelical sounds like someone or somebody who follows Billy Graham. Some believed that it sounds like the worship of angels through Christ. And some people believed that evangelical means someone who follows the Old Testament and wants no one to deviate from it. And some believe that evangelical means a new age Christian. Now, as you hopefully or probably realize, all of these definitions are way off base, way they are totally opposite to the truth. So let's look at the evangelicals or the conservative Protestants. They believe in the inerrancy of the Bible. In other words, they believe that the Bible, there's no errors in it. The Bible not only contains the word of God, but it is the word of God. God inspired the individual authors 
to prevent them from expressing error. The virgin conception of Jesus, often referred to as the virgin birth. They believe that Jesus Christ led a sinless life while he was on earth. They believe that Satan exists as a very powerful and all evil presence in the world and that he possesses many supernatural powers. Let's carry on with the evangelicals or the conservative Protestants. They believe that salvation is not achieved by doing good works. Only those who have trusted Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior will be born again, be saved, and go to heaven after death. They believe that hell exists as a place of eternal punishment for the unsaved. They believe that the return of Christ or Jesus Christ and the rapture where believers will rise through the air to meet Jesus Christ in the sky is imminent. Creation science. The belief that the universe was created by God less than 10,000 years ago. They reject the quest for the historical Jesus, which has been a focus of liberal and mainline theologians. All one needs to know about Jesus Christ is found in the New Testament. Now, in terms of social policies, now, now this, this is the evangelicals or the conservative uh, Christians. They are political conservatives, so politically they're conservative. They feel a strong obligation to evangelize or tell other people about Jesus Christ. They feel a strong obligation to share their religious beliefs with those who are not saved in order to bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus, are strongly opposed to women having access to abortion. And let's carry on with terms of social policies with regards to the evangelicals. They regard homosexuality as a chosen, changeable, sinful behavior, which is condemned by God. They often reject sexually active homosexuals as church members and certainly reject them as clergy members. They actively oppose and condemn any action to give gays and lesbians equal human rights, the same as that of heterosexuals, particularly the right to marry. The evangelicals or the conservative faith groups and parachurch organizations often recommend that their members vote for political candidates on the basis of their rejection of abortion access and equal rights for homosexuals. Now let's look at Protestant Christianity. Protestant, Protestant Christianity remains seriously fragmented around the world. There are over 1,500 Christian organizations in the United States alone, 
over 30,000 worldwide. Now, each of them follows a unique blend of beliefs and practices. A major, unbridgeable, and growing gulf exists between the conservative and the liberal wings. They share few beliefs about theology. They are in continual conflict over social matters, such as abortion access and same-sex marriage and the role of women in the family and church. So you can see the main things that tear the church apart in the Protestants between the liberals and the conservatives are the view on abortion and the view on sexuality. Now mainline Protestantism seems to be just a temporary holding zone for the members until they decide whether they will side with the liberals or with the conservatives. So the mainline Protestants are a very polarized group. So hopefully we don't end up with wars about the liberals and the conservatives. In the past, there were many wars over slavery and other social issues. But the social issues and the, and the controversy over issues such as abortion and homosexuality will continue in the Protestant church. And that brings us to the end of Protestantism today, the second part. Father God, we thank you for these studies on Protestantism today, part two. And I just pray that it would have given those who listened to this talk about Protestantism a bit of insight into the different churches and whether they should consider being more liberal or conservative. I just pray that you'll speak to their heart in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Join us every Sunday at 10 a.m. and Wednesdays nights at 7.30 p.m. Just go to abundance.online.church abundance.online.church or go to our website for all the details, churchofabundance.za.org, church of abundance, one word, churchofabundance.za.org, churchofabundance.za.org, and get all the details about the services and much more. Father God, we thank you for this time that we could have together. And I just pray that for those who tuned into this broadcast, that you will send your Holy Spirit to speak to their heart, that they will grow closer to you hour by hour, day by day, week by week, and month by month. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We're now going to play out with a beautiful piece of music by John Sayles. It's a Creative Commons license. Oh, holy night.